All right. Thank you very much for joining us today for an interview with my sisters, Bree and my sister Ollie. And both Hi. of them are my kidney donors. I have their kidneys in my body. Right now we're raising funds for the third year anniversary of Bree and my kidney transplant for the Gift of Life Transplant House. We just are so appreciative of everything that they do for people going through all kinds of organ, tissue, cell, eye transplants. I wanted to interview them today, hear from them what it's like to be a organ donor. You want to tell us what it was like going through the donor process? It was long. <laughs> it was thorough. Well, and we went to different hospitals. Yeah, they were very thorough tests, like testing the health of your entire body. Ollie and I went through transplant in 2010 at Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. You, you know, you'd go get labs and then it takes a little bit of time before you know anything from that. And then the next procedure happens. And so it's just time. Like you would think that it's quicker, but it's not. It's weeks. Yeah. And then two, the actual transplant is months. So you're... You know, you have, you're anxious and you're excited about this thing coming up and you're like, oh, three months later. Mm. What Ollie said prompted me to think, to remember that ev like every step of the way, they were very clear that at any moment in time, I could back out. That no one's feelings would be hurt, that, you know, the, they don't have to tell the recipient why the donor backs out, even though we're family and we talk all the time. They were really clear about that. It was nice to have that sort of checks and balance all along the way. Mm -hmm. Were there ever times during that process of testing that you questioned, what am I doing? Not until the like night before surgery. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, this is really happening and they're going to give me meds and I'm going to fall asleep and wake up and not know anything that happened. That's and that a really good point. That That's part. interesting. Worried me. Yeah. I was nervous because I've never had a major, aside from breaking a wrist, I'd never had major surgery, mm. but I wasn't, I didn't think, Oh, what am I doing ever at any point? I just thought, Oh, this is happening tomorrow and had anxiety and they didn't put me to sleep until I was in there. So, you know, I, they give you, they gave me something to make me kind of loopy. And then in order to get me onto the table, cause I was sideways on it, I was laying sideways with my arm over, I was awake. So I went in the surgery room awake and saw the stainless steel. And I think at that moment, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what is about to happen? I'm in this stainless steel room with the big lights, you know? And then yeah. I was out. Yeah. It's very sterile in there. Wow. It's kind of cold. And yeah, it's just, it's like going to the vet. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, it's just all stainless steel. Nothing's fancy. Nothing's cute. <laughs> You're just in there and it's like, oh, so you guys can just come hose this place off later if you need to. Okay. <laughs> this is comforting. Right. But the guys were nice and, and I remember that they were kind and like they knew that I didn't know what was going on. So they were just like, okay, and put your arm up over here. And, and then I was out. So Bree, you, you had some nerves come up the night before. What did you do to kind of overcome that or I think I did a lot of journaling I took a hot shower I did my bowel cleanse <laughs> mm -hmm. read a book just kept it like quiet and I was at the gift of life house and we just hung out and talked and went to sleep I remember them coming into the pre-op room talking to me and then injecting me with 
the sedative that was making me a little loopy. So by the time I got into the OR, I do remember scooching over to the table in the bright light. I, I was way out of it. Mm. The pre, the workup, I was really impressed about the Mayo Clinic where I had my workup and it was so thorough. And having worked in hospitals, it just felt like everybody was in the web. And I was this little spider crawling through the web, picking up, you know, and dropping off different pieces of information, whether it's the CT scan or the echocardiogram or my labs or the kidney function test or mm -hmm. it really was a trial of patience for sure. Like Ollie said, it just took time. And like, I was exhausted by the end of the day of the appointments. And even though it wasn't physically exacerbating, it was just interesting being on the patient side mm -hmm. versus the nursing side, which is what I'm used to. Yeah. yeah, Brie, you're a nurse, and so this was such a, a different role for you as a patient. Mm -hmm. why, why is that? Different side of the counter. <laughs> <laughs> um, diff, you know, sitting in the waiting room. I'm waiting with all the other people waiting. You know, who is making eye contact? Who isn't? Who's in a hurry? Who isn't? And I never got the feeling of any of the professionals that I worked with, that any of them were inconvenienced, in a hurry, had their mind elsewhere. They were just really present with you. And, and they seemed like genuinely interested and grateful for what I was giving. Mm. It felt really good. You guys went through testing. You go into the sterile surgical room. A lot of people are going to wonder why. Why were you willing to do this? I think why is such an interesting question because I never thought twice about it. I always knew that when you needed the kidney, that if I was a good candidate, I wouldn't question at all, not even for one second, that I would be one who would give it. It's interesting to me. I, I know people think about this, of course, and maybe it's different if it's not your sibling. I don't know. You know, maybe if it's a sibling I didn't get along with, it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, you know, but it was just sure. easy. And so saying why, I mean, the answer is because, of course, of course I would. I, it was not a question in my mind the whole time. Mm. Not, one, not at one, not, not then, not now, not ever has it been a thing that I've had to like weigh. Yeah. I haven't looked at the, you know, the pros and cons or like, and none of that. I was just like, if I'm the candidate and I'm the best one, then that's why. Yeah. yeah I mean, I just think it's pretty profound that both of you are very healthy had never been through major surgery before. What about you, Bree? Yeah, I think Ollie and I were probably ready before you were. <laughs> <laughs> you were. <laughs> In a way, yes, I agree with everything Ollie just said. And it seemed like the most efficient way to get you to a point in which you could carry on healthily faster. Like, what's the most direct route? Let's do that. Mm. <laughs> yeah right like yeah no question what yeah what needs to be done mm -hmm. okay move and and then just go do it yeah do the test, take the stuff like it's just interesting I because I know people who have given to a stranger I think the why is irrelevant because if you're going to be a donor it's so much bigger than a why it's not like buying a car Mm -hmm. mm. it's not just like a regular choice of a red or a blue car suv mm -hmm. or a sedan <laughs> right is it yep. did it have it did it have anything to do with seeing me before transplant seeing what i was going through any of that i mean i didn't like that but no i just knew i'm going to do this I guess if, if we're going to get down to brass tacks, okay, the reason I did it because is if it prolongs your life, then that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. H how, you know, can we prolong Lacey's life? Yes. 
by a transplant. Okay, then that's why. And of course, you having better health and being back to like what could be normal or a, you know, some kind of homeostasis, of course, I, that is part of it so that you can just keep living. It's really simple though. That's simple to me. Wow. It's really remarkable, honestly. That is going to blow some people's minds, perhaps, because I think there might be people that feel like they would never do it. Have you heard that, Bree? Anybody say, I would never do that? I, I've heard them say, I could never do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could ever do that. It's one of those things that I really don't think you can ever imagine what your choice would be until you're faced with the opportunity. Mm -hmm. The opportunity, what a profound word to use. It, does it feel like an opportunity? What are some of the takeaways from your experience? Um, this, that we get to spend more time with our sister. Yeah. That's the takeaway. Woohoo! <laughs> That's like the only one that matters to me. We've this had some cool. pretty awesome adventures since yeah. going through all of this too. Mm -hmm. There's a real spiritual aspect to, for me. It was a profoundly spiritual experience to go through the entire process and up till now. And I don't know that I would have gotten to take a look at certain parts of myself and myself in relationship with my sisters had I not gone through with this. Can you or tell us more about that? Well, I don't know if it's like this for you, Ollie. Lacey and I have always had a pretty deep connection from growing up together. Through sharing an organ, sometimes I feel like I can feel Lacey thinking about me or, or talking or I don't know. It's, it's not a conscious thing. It's like a, she pops into my mind mm. I call her, and she was thinking the same thing. Mm, okay. Oh, interesting. You think that's from the kidney transplant or just that you guys grew up together? <laughs> <laughs> you guys fried cheese together. Right? <laughs> and now Ryan kidneys. I love it. Whatever it is, I, it's really cool. I just love it. Yeah. I speak to that too. I don't really know if it's a spiritual thing, but I, something profound definitely happened. And I've talked to other donors. They can they describe it, but they, we don't have a name for it. It has something to do with pure altruism. I don't know if you get an opportunity to be completely 100% altruistic ever. So it's just mm. no questions about giving this mm. to someone for no other reason than feel better. Or it's really interesting. Mm. Like yeah, a saw. pure gift. Yeah, mm. like there's nothing in it for me. Mm -mm. It's not transactional. No. no, it's not transactional at all. It could be, but it's not, I mean, it wasn't for us. It wasn't like, give me your kidney for 40 grand or anything. You know, it wasn't like that. Um, I wanted to say that as a recipient, the social workers and the transplant team also, you know, asked me about pressuring you guys into giving your kidney and. Oh, no. And in fact, they kept asking me, <laughs> is anyone threatening you? Is anyone offering you money? Oh, oh, yes, they do ask that, don't they? Yeah. On all the questions on like my caseworker would ask me that. Yeah. You have to ensure that there's no bribery going on. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was like, no, I, I, I'm not going to bribe them to do this. I don't even want to ask them. <laughs> I think I did go through a little grieving process for my kidney. Mm -hmm. I definitely went through a little like depression after. Mm -hmm. And it might have been also contributing to the hype of the event. Mm -hmm. the event happened and then okay go back to life but I also felt somewhat like I needed to make up for that empty space it was an interesting void for a little bit what did you do to help get through that or feel fill in that space I would meditate or dream daydream of a little fountain that my ex existing kidney was a little fountain. I think it was an empty space fountain in that place where the kidney, mm -hmm. and it would be continually like, you know, you know, those fireworks that have that like 
burst and then they get brighter and brighter as they grow mm -hmm. like that but in a continual bright little <laughs> fat in there a visual i'm so visual <laughs> yeah i'm seeing that yeah super visual <laughs> oh i love that mm -hmm. the fountain of youth fountain I of life feeling sad too but i don't know if it was had heightened anxiety going in and then and then you also can't lift things or do things or but i remember feeling sad like oh this is interesting and they mention it they say you you'll, you may go through a little bit of depression i mean it makes sense it's part of your endocrine it's your endocrine system which is full of hormones which is also like a postpartum -y type losing a piece of your body and your body knows it it's interesting yeah postpartum me at least you've not had kids so you don't get that exactly like we do but well speaking of being a mom you are both mothers you donated while your children were young let's talk about that a little bit was there a fear you know the risk of surgery what that might do to your children if something happened to you yeah I definitely can sit thought about it I didn't want to live in the fear of what if and then risk losing my sister not enough of a like guarantee for me nobody wants to think about those things but <laughs> I mean, they brought it up in the training, the education piece, and I definitely thought about it. And they also mentioned, what if one of your children needs a kidney down the road? Now you're not a candidate. Mm -hmm. mm. That's true. Hope that that doesn't require a... Their sibling is a good match. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that I had total 100% blind faith in the surgeons. I didn't think about something bad going wrong at all. I mean, I, I, I thought there was, you know, a couple times I thought, oh my gosh, if something happens, I think Fina was more scared for me. She was worried. Your daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My niece, Fina. She's quite anxious anyway. So I think that she had some moments of anxiety about me and that I would have to reassure her. You know, talking about both of you being mothers, I have to say there's something I, I think every time I see Fina and Ply, Sawyer and Isla, my nieces and nephews, when I see them, I remember their mother's organ is in my body, mm. you know, a part of them. Like I'm sharing something with them too and there's mm -hmm. something really special there i mean i feel that about both of you but mm -hmm. i also feel that about them i'm sharing sort of a a nurturing with them now oh that's cool, cool. yeah and that yeah. is an interesting perspective that you have part of their mom, <laughs> mom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I feel very, like, very nurturing towards them, I think, because of that. Huh. There was one moment, though, that I thought, what if I need another one? Where's that going to come from? The, I think that was something that came up in my mind. The one, the one chubby one that I got now is not, doesn't, isn't working. I've thought about that. Did they tell you in your workup? Did they talk to you at all about what would happen if you did need a, a kidney down the road? Not that I remember, not specifically. I remember them saying that it would be a very similar, similar workup to the one I was going through and that there's, I forget what they called it, but I keep wanting to call it a pool party. <laughs> <laughs> you have a group donation where there's yeah. donors, two or three in a group, and then their kidneys go to the appropriate recipient within their wheel of recipients that they brought to the group. Yeah, and, exactly. And Bree, is this true for you too? I think now that you said that, I think they mentioned that as a donor, you go to the top of the list. Is that I true? Yeah, I don't remember that. That that's what I thought as well. That's what I understood as well. That if something happens to you and you need a life-saving kidney, that because okay. you've been a donor, that you would go, yeah. It's a different list. It's a donor needing a donor list. Mm -hmm. Different. Yeah. So the organ pool that Bree's talking about is if, let's say, Ollie or Brie could not be my organ donor because we didn't have the same blood type, our tissue didn't match or something like that, 
then let's say somebody else's family member also couldn't give to them, then we could do a swap. Sometimes there's like six recipients, six donors, they all kind of exchange (laughs) organs. It's complicated, but it's been one of the ways to increase the likelihood of organ donation success by having living donors. People are going to be wondering, what was it like post-operative? Yeah. What, was, what was your experience after surgery? I know it was different. That's for the part they're people. not going to want to know. <laughs> Skip over that part. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have huge incisions, first of all? I mean, no. they, three they, lap sites. That's it. So yeah. They did it laparoscopically. So just yeah. little, oh, little wait. incisions. Four. I have four. I have three lap sites and an incision. And yeah. I want to describe how they, how they get it out. Cause I loved how my doctor said this. I was like, so what are they going to do? Cause you know, they only have the ports in you and they're in there, you know, it was four laps. And then they have a incision. It's right at your pubic line and I was like what in the world how do you get it out of there then and he said well there's a little you put a little net in and and the little kidney goes in the net and then they pull it out and I was like oh my gosh okay you're gonna go fish it on out of there I thought that was so cute I pictured this little guy getting a little net I didn't have a net I had a hand he said then we Put our hand inside, grab and hold the kidney and pull it out. With their actual hand. hand. Some guy's hand was in there. (laughs) (laughs) I like the net better. (laughs) Yeah, they said it was like a little a little net goes in and they put it in and then they drawstring it shut and pull it out. Wow, that's amazing. But the gas. So your organs aren't like wet noodles smashed on each other and they're trying to keep them out of the way. They put that gas in. So now all your organs are big fluffy balloons in there. And then you're just this giant barrel after. You feel like if they, you know, those, those uh, like a balloon. And then if you just bend it over, it like snaps right back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I honestly just wished I could have just let out a giant fart and let all the air come out because I just couldn't handle this big barrel. And then that gas coming up and trying to come out of your body would pull or whatever right here. I just felt like there was an ice pit going through my shoulder. They would come in and they're like, are you doing okay? I'm like, morphine. Like, (laughs) Oh, give me some morphine. Just couldn't sleep. That was the most painful experience you had. So not the incision sites, not the laparoscopic sites. It was the air that they blow into you, that kind of gas. gas. It's that gas that they put in there to blow up your organs. I've had that gas too. And and it's referred pain. So for some reason, that referred pain goes up into your shoulder joints. Yeah, it's bizarre. And your body is supposed to just absorb all of that, right? It just rises. Like a helium balloon rises. Gas rises. Yeah, so it was literally trapped right here. Yeah. So- they didn't tell me about that. So when they were like, so, you know, how are you? What are you feeling? I'm like, oh, I feel like an ice pick is in my shoulder. And they're like, oh, <laughs> it's the gas. And I'm like, <laughs> why didn't they tell me? They did then. But maybe they were just hoping that it wouldn't happen. I don't Definitely know. pain after with the gas. It more in my belly than up in my shoulders. Did you feel like a barrel? <laughs> like you- exploded. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not like just your stomach. It's like from your freaking diaphragm down. It's just a big barrel. <laughs> like I was, I had given birth. Exploded. Yeah. Yeah. Pictures that I've seen of myself right after are hilarious. <laughs> with the like, where, where I have no waist <laughs> it's literally gone it's just a did you have a binder I don't know if they gave me a binder I can't remember that that would have been probably a good idea a binder's the the thing squeeze that kind of the the gas on out. you yeah squeeze it, you. it felt good to have a binder on yeah Perfect. very supportive I had a binder too and maybe I did I just don't remember 
Um, so how long after surgery were you able to start doing things? That day. Yeah, I got right up and walked. Can't what about, talking. what were some of the drawbacks post-operatively? Well, you can't pick up 10 pounds for the first week or two weeks, and then you can't pick up 25 pounds for the next three, something like that. You don't want to move. If that's the kind of j- job you have, then you're going to have to take time off your work because you can't lift so much weight. I took eight weeks off work yeah. and I was glad I took the eight because at six weeks I was feeling pretty good, but I know I would have gone right back to hundred mm-hmm. percent effort at work. Mm-hmm. Whereas that two weeks gave me that much more time to just go on longer walks outside, get strong, yeah. feel that much more regular normal. Yeah. yeah. I would say that I probably started feeling back to absolute normal three months after. I would agree with that emotionally and physically and financially. I mean, it took a hit for me. I was able to get some disability, short-term disability, but it wasn't my full wage. I was fine, but it was definitely a, a thing. Yeah. That- that was. That's another part of donation that falls into that consideration of taking time off of work, time away from family, maybe home. Speaking of being away from home, Bree, you came all the way from New Hampshire. And when Ollie and I had our transplant, we didn't have a transplant center in Idaho. We both went to Washington. Bree, you and I stayed at the Gift of Life transplant house. What was that like? Um, amazing it was like being at grandma betty's house it was really homey clean warm smell good quiet just a healing center is what it felt like nice. people were healing we're going through a lot people were really present we got to stay in the same place together yeah that's nice i feel like ours was a little more chaotic just that a lot of the testing i did in Idaho first, and then went over there a week before, stayed in an apartment downtown in Seattle by myself. I had a hotel room the night before, but we weren't really together. You were in a different hotel than I was. That always felt just disconnected or just, you know, I mean, it was what it was and that's okay. Going to the transplant house would have been really nice if we would have could have been there together and the family could have kind of come and saw us together. Yeah. The other thing too is, they kept people away from you. I couldn't see my kids before, didn't see a, a lot of people till after for, you know, good reason. They didn't want, they wanted to keep me healthy, but I did have to stay away from my kids. That must have been so difficult. Yeah. They were, they were still young too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the reason is you don't want to get sick right before going through major surgery or getting sick and then giving your organ, your recipient like me, who has no immune system, they basically knock your immune system totally out so that your body doesn't reject the organ. That was hard. That was a very, it was very, it felt so different, felt very disconnected for you and I, Ollie, compared to the experience that I had with Brie at the Gift of Life transplant house. It makes a big difference. How many years out are you from an Ollie transplant? Me and Ollie had our transplant in 2010, so it's been 12 years. Wow. Ollie's kidney is still in my body. And so I have three kidneys now. I have more kidneys than both of you. <laughs> I, um, I guess you can have 10. Because <laughs> I asked you for my kidney back. I said, can I have it back? And like put it in a jar or something. And <laughs> you were like, oh, no, no, no. It'll stay in there. Mm-hmm. And you can just keep packing them in there if you need to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I didn't I didn't know that until I went through the whole shebang. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Do you both have any advice? What would you do differently if you mm. had to do it over or do it again? I'd go to the transplant house. I would absolutely yeah. have much rather have gone where I was with Lacey. We were together. Family could be there. You know, some of the family could be there. We're both in the same place. So if someone did want to come, we're both there. We're spending time together before and after that. Mm-hmm. I would much rather have that. Or you didn't have that. 
I am too. Oh, and the recovery. Oh my, what would you avoid, I mean, Ollie? I Well, yeah, I thought about this. If I was going to do it again, I would make sure that I had someone knew their job was to be my advocate. They go get me a tissue. They get me a water. They get me, they rub my back. They like, they're my person and they're, that is their job. They get me food, get me some socks. Like particularly the, la- the the first two days after you're not, you don't feel like moving around. And so mm-hmm. you really need someone who's like, they're there serving you. Definitely don't <laughs> where people think it's a family reunion <laughs> that your kidney transplant is a family reunion. <laughs> or just wait, have a family reunion separate from the kidney transplant. <laughs> Oh. Wait till we're all better and we can go have a party. Have a party. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that that's just, the, our, our family in particular wanted to be together. And I don't think we understood the, like the gravity of it. And so when you're then in it, you're like, oh yeah, what would I do different? I would go to the transplant house and then have people stay someplace else. And have my advocate with me and, but spend time with Lacey. Like I remember when the minute I woke up from surgery post-op, I was like, where's Lacey? And I was super out of it. They thought, oh my God. And I didn't care. They were like, oh, she's going to find Lacey. I was out of bed and I'm like, oh my gosh, you just got out of bed. They're they're like, oh, someone push these things along because she's freaking going. (laughs) <laughs> grab the wheelie bobbers come on we gotta go she's out of here and I went down the hall and I go in there and I'm just totally high and I was like hey, hey, hey. and someone videotaped it it's hilarious yeah it's really and we like crowned each other these two totally high people <laughs> yeah. loved it, it but so- that would have been fun to do to like and be together yeah Uh, yeah going through it twice the first time we just had no idea what to expect it was it was just a really big deal for our whole family that two siblings are going through this major thing i'd been on dialysis for seven years trying to avoid surgery (laughs) avoiding some things here's a what not to do although it was so much fun don't go to europe don't go to italy doing peritoneal dialysis (laughs) okay folks Unless you want to carry a 150 pound body around Europe. We carried all these dialysate bags, these IV bags everywhere. Italy. Remember though, everybody got a cha- their turn to lay on it at the, at the train stop. <laughs> like <just laughs> plop that thing down and it was like a <laughs> waterbed. Ah. <laughs> it was like a waterbed. What about you, Brie? What would you do differently or do you have some advice? I would be very clear and explicit with my caregiver what I needed. I didn't know what I needed. I wasn't at the time great for about asking Mm -hmm. what I need. I needed to not make any decisions. He knew what I liked to eat and drink. Be confident in his choice. I needed that. Just do it for you. Just do it for me. Bring it. I did eventually, I was able to articulate my needs. Once I got over my stage fright brain cluster about it. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I mean, that's a huge mm-hmm. challenge for us in general as people asking for what we need. But as a patient, that's such a huge learning experience. I think I liked more time with you at the transplant house. You stayed longer. I felt I needed to get back to my kids. Yeah. Which, of course, was great. And... It would have been nice to have just like one more week there with you mm. to just really process stuff, do more puzzles, watch more Disney movies, re- knit more, re- revel in that opportunity because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for yeah. me yeah. to just mm-hmm. kind of give yourself space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. to rest and recover. That makes me realize how really monumental that place is because you know a a foundation can pay for a place for you to stay but it's not going to provide that that's pivotal to to be at a place where you're you someone else can stay as well and take care of you and 
you have time, plenty of time to stay there. Yes. Be there, it's safe, it's quiet. If we ever get the opportunity to take you there, Ollie, I would love to create one, mm. another one somewhere for people. Homemade quilts, homemade food, there's potluck, family oriented. There's an essence to the community that I love and that I really appreciate. It's like the yeah. transplant commune. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. I mean, a really beautiful aspect of it is that everyone there is going through this major life changing thing. Yeah. And you eat together because there's a cafeteria area and you prepare yeah. meals together. And sometimes you share food or mm -hmm. share stories and experiences. And yeah, that was a really beautiful thing. It's a great place of healing. Yeah. That's what it is, a house of healing. Mm -hmm. I really like that there was no checkout date when you first get there. You're not not like a hotel where you have to say, I'll be here from here to here. Yeah. And if you're not out of there by the end of it, then your room, you lose your room. Yeah. It's an open-ended. Mm -hmm. so you tell them when you're ready to go. Yeah, that having space. <laughs> that space for recovery. I mean, no eating in your room. No, there was no TVs. In they the were, room, yeah. Home, but without a TV and ho it had homemade quilts on the beds, they don't want you isolating in your room. And you had house chores. You or your house, your caregiver were responsible for this day you take oh. out the trash. This day you great. sweep the floors. We all <laughs> pick up the tables and counters after ourselves. And that's cool. It was so it was cool. cool. It made it really affordable to not have this whole staff. Very, very inexpensive, which would have been so huge for you and I, Ollie. Holy cow, it was expensive in Seattle. Well, and it doesn't introduce a bunch of outside people. There, There is a room, like a family room. You can have visitors, but they're not allowed to like come in. Mm -hmm. The main area. I mean, like yeah. kitchen, not allowed in your rooms. They stay in the front of the house. It's interesting. It's a really great model. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, the gift of life transplant house is really special. So how are you doing now? It's been 12 years for you and I, Ollie. This is our third anniversary for you, Bree. How are you doing now? What's happening in your life? I'm 50 and I can kick and I can stretch. <laughs> I, I think that it helps a lot that we're already healthy. Like, I mean, Bree and I, I would consider exceptionally healthy people. We don't smoke. We don't drink. You know, we eat healthy. I'm a mostly vegan eater. I exercise. You know, we're both runners. We're like healthy people. So I think that we're, we may be the exception. I don't know, but I feel awesome. I don't, I don't feel like I'm lacking in something or that I'm even missing my kidney it doesn't cause a health issue. I'm healthy as heck. I know because when you, you know, you get your labs, the nephrologist, they're like, oh, great. Your kidney's doing better than it was before. It's fat. Like my kidney is big. It's, oh, wow. It's gotten, it's not double in size, but it's like definitely bigger to compensate. Oh, so it kind of adapts to, to the so change. I said yep. to the, you know, my chubby kidneys in there because it's grown. Interesting. I don't know if mine has or not. I didn't know that. <laughs> what about you, Bree? How are you feeling? What's going on in your life? I'm 38. I'm chasing two teens around, two dogs, and I work full time as a nurse. I run three or four or five days a week. I don't notice anything different either. I'm definitely more conscious of maintaining my health where before I think I was just my motivation was to stay thin or to clear my head stay mentally clear now it's more eat and exercise and sleep and hydrate and meant and be mindful of my mental health because I have a little more to protect keep my lungs and heart healthy you know the awareness yeah, the awareness, but no chain. I feel no lack either. No, nothing. Mm -mm. Given your whole experience, would you, and, and you are back to square one where you started, would you do it again? 
Yeah. Yep. One hundred percent. Yes. Yep. I would just stay at the transplant house this time. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. We really appreciate the Gift of Life Transplant House. And as our third anniversary, raising funds for for the GOL. And if you feel inspired to give, we are raising three thousand dollars for the third anniversary. We really appreciate you celebrating with us. I want to thank my sisters and these life saving donors for all that they sacrificed and gave so that I could be here today. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Bree. Thank you, Ollie. I love you guys. <laughs> love you too. You're going to make us cry. <laughs> I'm so, so glad that we, that giving kidneys is a, is a possibility. Thank you. Thank you, science. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So grateful to our caregivers, you know, our doctors nurses, people that are right there by our side, making this possible. I've been given 12 extra years of life and definitely could not haul around that dialysis (laughs) any longer. (laughs) Dialysis is wonderful, but being able to go mountain biking with you guys and go Mm -hmm. down the river and go to hot springs and just have a ball, be able to travel and be with you guys, Mm -hmm. doing peer support and crafting and being with my nieces and nephews, watching them grow up. Yay. I feel very grateful. I am very grateful to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kidney. (laughs) Let's make a kidney. Kidney. (laughs) Kidneys. Mm. (laughs) Holding the computer with one hand. (laughs) <laughs> thank you sisters thank you so much you're welcome mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. thank you gift of life transplant house yes, yes thank, thank you, you. Woo-hoo.